Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. I guess it's like not knowing what it is that's coming and understanding that the thing that you don't know that's coming might come. To know that that, that newness is around the corner, that newness can, can, can come to you at any time, that makes you prepared. Welcome in the Envelope listeners to another episode of the podcast. Today's guest, the voice you just heard, is the incredible, I was going to say up and coming, but definitely no longer up and coming talent, Cynthia Arrivo. If you don't know who she is by now, pause this and go watch Widows, Bad Times at the El Royale, and her Oscar-nominated work in Harriet as Harriet Tubman. This was such a fun interview, and it was one of the first interviews we did over Zoom video, which I really think made for an even better conversation. Of course, we did discuss uh, life amid this new normal, of this new pandemic. You'll hear kind of her update on where she is on, in that part of her journey. It's really amazing to hear her journey. I mean, we interviewed her back in 2015, and then we interviewed her, uh, I believe, in 2018 as well. It's this career that has skyrocketed, and this is a great interview to kind of illustrate how she thinks about that, how she manifested that. It's very inspirational, and if you stick around to the end of the interview, you will hear me maybe in the background freaking out over Cynthia's response to the question I've been asking everyone, which is, what is one performance every actress should see and why? Because she gave, like, in my opinion, like, the greatest, most, most certainly most Jack Smart uh, answer to that question. Um, so definitely stick around for that. And I just wanted to note again, as I did in our last episode, Backstage stands with the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, we are linking in our episode description to an article titled Resources During the Black Lives Matter Movement. It does include organizations to get involved with or to donate to, film and TV shows to watch, and activists to follow. Um, I'm reading here, it says, Backstage is committed to spotlighting, protecting, and uplifting Black and Brown narratives. And we want to give our readers access to the information they need to help us in that mission. So... We're going to link to that. I hope everyone who's listening to this is safe and healthy. Let's take a quick break to hear a word from today's sponsor and then get to this incredible interview with Cynthia Arrivo. This episode is brought to you by UCLA's professional programs at the School of Theater, Film, and Television. Applications are now available for UCLA's professional program in acting for the camera. Gain knowledge from successful industry professionals and receive a world-class acting education in three quarters consisting of scene study, acting for the camera, and career development workshops, an intimate classroom environment with a maximum of 16 students per workshop, access to casting decision makers, and a certificate of completion from the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Students are encouraged to apply early, space is limited, admission is competitive, just Google UCLA Professional Programs and you'll find them. Cynthia Arrivo's lifelong dream of performing professionally was kicked into high gear with the Broadway transfer of the Color Purple revival from her hometown of London, subsequently earning her a Tony Award and a Daytime Emmy Award. She then jumped to the big screen in Widows, Bad Times at the El Royale, and as Harriet Tubman in Harriet, which this year earned her Oscar nominations for Leading Actress and Original Song. Cynthia stars on HBO's adaptation of Stephen King's The Outsider as Holly Gibney, and in National Geographic's upcoming miniseries Genius Aretha as Aretha Franklin. Here is the wonderful Cynthia Erivo.
Welcome to uh, Backstage's podcast. How are you? I'm good. I'm good, actually. Very good. Yeah. Are you in LA? Yes, I'm in LA. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. And um, how are you or what's been going on in your um, life and career? It's a busy. Um, I just finished doing, well, I was in the middle of shooting the Aretha um, Genie series yeah. and then everything sort of like shut down. We're like on episode six of eight. Um, I think so yeah. when all of this um, comes back, we, who knows when, we'll be back at, back shooting that but before that I finished shooting The Outsider which I guess we're going to be talking about today as well Um, and and I think I was super surprised by the response I loved shooting it and I loved um, what it felt like I loved the character I think what surprised me was the response that it got from people that that like blew me away I didn't know that we would have so many people like into it and then I've been here and I've been recording some things. I've been, I, I did American Idol. Uh, I've just yeah. uh, performed something for a Memorial Day for PBS. Uh, I've Amazing. done a full like story time with uh, Taika Waititi. He did James and the Giant Peach. Cool, yeah. Uh, so like bits and pieces are happening, yeah. And I've done, I did a little series for Nike as well. Um, so that's really kind of cool, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Really cool. Like, is there also like, a, are you um, on the creative? What's your creative life like right now? Are you doing any songwriting? Yes. Are you yeah, yeah. frozen? I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I'm doing some songwriting, some recording. My record label is like very pleased at this moment because it means I'm not going anywhere. I, I'm not traveling anywhere. So I've got my <laughs> up and they're like, so since you're in one place, do you think we can start recording some of <laughs> your song <laughs> so that's what we we're working on, on with it we just cool. finished the first one which we wanted to come out so that's kind of cool yeah are you recording right there in your yeah where you are yeah yeah i have a little Amazing. studio set up yeah yeah this little room that i'm in is like a working studio so i'm here uh-huh. at the desk i've got like enco- like i had an encoder in here i did i filmed um American Idol in this room against that ring light and some lighting setup. So I've got lighting in here. I've got a, oh, yeah. a really beautiful microphone and a, a studio setup coming like here as well, which I want to try and like define because I think this room is going to remain like this even afterwards because it's been really wonderful to be oh, this sure. independent when it comes to making things. Um, totally. I have a little ADR little station that, I, that, that I've been doing. So I've, I've got ADR for Aretha wow. and I've got a setup for wow. ADR. So like this whole room is just like a functioning studio for all the things I might I need. I think that's, that's true of a lot of just working artists right now. Like yeah. you got to set up a home studio. You got to maybe invest in some equipment. Uh, yeah. I, I, the moment, I mean, I'm lucky because I, I can and I can afford to. And I know that there are people who, who might not be able to, but mm. if you can, do it because it just gives you a, a level of freedom that you might not have experienced before. So I've got like mm. as in here and an iPad that works for this and a microphone that works for that, a ring light for this and this little setup here. So it means that I, I can do whatever I need to do really. Yeah. Amazing. Kind of cool. It also, it's sort of sounds like amid this pandemic, there's no excuses. You're, you're held yeah. accountable and yeah. you have stuff to do. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm getting stuff done, which is actually really kind of cool. And learning, I'm learning so much more than I have before, because usually okay. I'm used to have like things getting done. You walk into a studio and you, you they tell you where to be and you, you have your head, your ears and whatnot, but you don't have to do the whole setup yourself. But with American Idol, I set it up. The encoder was here. The, the monitor was here. Here are the wires. Here is the screen. Here oh, are the wow, microphones. Yeah. Here's what we're using as the cameras. Here's the lighting. Set it up. And that's what that's what I did. Over the phone with someone sort of like, can you grab this? This wire looks like this. And you just set everything on your own. And it's the same that's music amazing. studio. I was, I was on the phone with my producer who is a tech genius. And he was like, so these are the things. Let's set it up. It's yeah. been amazing. And you've had to learn. Yeah. 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 That's amazing, especially just thinking about like like that interview that you and I apparently did back in 2015, then to now has been such a whirlwind. And I'm wondering, like, it sounds like this pandemic has not really slowed things down for you. No. It's just been go, go, go. No, I've, I've been on, I, I've, I had to tell my assistant, which also I learned when we were, when we were doing that interview, I think I was in the middle of like double booking myself for everything, trying to tell everything yes. on my own. And I was like, I'm not doing this very well. 
and I ah. found an assistant and, and I've learned that having mm. to help is actually really helpful and to not be ashamed of that. Um, mm. but yeah, amid this, I've told my assistant, listen, I, can you p- put one day where I don't have anything to do <laughs> because yes. it, every day is like full at the moment. Every day has something, there's an, there's an interview or a video to tape or a something like there's always something. And that I've had yeah. so many zoom meetings and calls that I mm-hmm. can tell you. Um, and there's lots of stuff to do and I've got lots of reading to do, lots of scripts are mm-hmm. coming in, working on developing something. And I'm like, there's, I'm working. That's for sure. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Wow. Can I ask what kind of scripts are you being sent or reading? Uh, films and series. Films and series. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's great, especially with everything so uncertain. Yeah. 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 And people are still like looking at things. People are still, and it's wonderful because people are working as though there, are, there is a future, which is, we should. Um, yeah. And I, and I, you know, it's, I'd, I would rather find out what we're doing and figure out how we're moving forward. So that mm. when we do move forward, we're not like, now, where do we start? The, yeah. the conversations and figuring stuff out is kind of cool. And also like learning about what do we do if we do want to make things in this time, like mm-hmm. here from our homes and from the places that we're in, how do we keep creating? How do we keep, do we keep filming? Are there things that we can do from the home that don't involve us moving from where we are? So we can still put things out that, um, make people happy and, and we can still create. It's just about shifting the, the view or the focus of, on, on the ways in which we create, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's actually, I mean, we're really, uh, as always on this podcast, we're looking for advice, Yes. but it's true that these days it's advice in this, in this strange time. I mean, can I ask how you, how you felt when all of this started, especially with the interruption of Aretha? Like, is there anything you can tell other artists who are maybe stuck at home that's advice in terms of how to navigate this existentially, emotionally? <laughs> I guess I felt a sense of, I guess, panic and relief all at once. Mm. Um, you get sort of like, oh God, what on earth is happening and how? And then mm. for me, because of what the last couple of years have been like, I I hadn't had a break. I hadn't, I hadn't really stopped. Uh, so I was exhausted genuinely exhausted like bone tired and i remember after doing the 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 run for the oscars and the awards <laughs> the day after the oscars i came back to set to film so i didn't have a break <laughs> i yeah so i was at the oscars i flew back then i want to say the next the next day i feel like it was the next day i flew back the next day and i was back at work yeah Somewhere in there also was the premiere of The Outsider. Yeah. Yeah. So the premiere of The Outsider happens and I went back to work the next day. It's like I, like I didn't, I was, I was doing t- two things uh, at the same time. So I was doing the award season. I had premiere of uh, The Outsider happened during award season. So I was doing yeah. stuff for The Outsider, award season and Aretha all at once. And so when... Uh, everything sort of stopped award season for me stopped in March. Like it stopped yeah. beginning of March, end of February. And I continued doing Aretha. So I, yeah. so I didn't stop in between any of that stuff, which means I had no break at all. And I was so tired that w- yeah. by the time we, this happened, I just was able to breathe. For me, it really was like a moment where I was like, Oh, I can, I can sleep. Yeah. Good. <laughs> And I think that, and that might be different for everyone else. You know, someone who's just started something after a long hiatus of waiting for something, there is going to be a sense of panic. Mm. Uh, and, and I want that person to know that we will get started again. Mm. And in this time, it's about one reaching, and I'm going to tell this to people because I really think that people are ashamed of it. Reach out to the people you know that can help you if you need the help. Yes. Ask for help. Mm. I've been I've been talking to a lot of people and I've been trying to help as many people as I can. But the advice I give to everybody is to ask for help if you need it. Mm. Is that's the only way you'll get it. You know what I'm saying? Oh yeah. That yes. And and I think and and for those who are comfortable, this is a really great time to be okay with taking a break, mm. resting, 
and then finding ways to be creative. Mm -hmm. There are ways to be creative in this moment and there are ways to learn things. My friend in London, um, he automatically, when it all started happening, was like, well, I'm going to learn a language. So he has Spanish Mm -hmm. lessons every evening at nine, Mm -hmm. I think eight or nine. And he's really like specific about it. He's like, I'm going to, uh, we'll be on the phone. He's like, oh, it's time for me to go to my, my Spanish class. I've got to go. And he'll go and learn Spanish. And it's just about... I guess it's like changing the viewpoint on where you might be. Mm. If you can be creative, be creative. Mm. If you want to work out, want work out. If you're someone who's worked out consistently and you want to stop for a second, stop for a second. It really oh, yeah. is about figuring out what you and your body needs mm. because it will tell you. Yes. And your mind will tell you what you need. Um, have the conversations with people that you have wanted to have before and you haven't had yet mm. connect with people that you want to reconnect with that you haven't done so far. And you've been putting off for ages. Uh, I've reconnected with, with a couple of people. I've spoken to people who I may speak to every day, but haven't had like the conversations that we wanted to have, haven't had the time to like pour into each other. Yeah. And now we do like, I often get like someone will get into my mind and they will, they'll stay there until I reach out to that person. So mm. I have fallen into the habit of making sure that if that person comes into my mind, I reach out yeah. just to say, I'm thinking of you. Yeah. And now I have the time to actually follow that through. Like before it may have taken like a day or so. I thought about that person yesterday. I haven't done it today, but now today, like now mm. if it happens, I can do it automatically. Yeah attention to those things mm. so it's a sign that, you know maybe that person needs help maybe that person is thinking of you maybe that because i believe that we work in energy mm-hmm. so if i if i'm giving off an energy like i wish i could speak to so and so that person might automatically like think of me and then i'll get a text from that person mm. that's how it works you know totally you put out good energy and that energy comes back that's how it works mm-hmm. and i think that we have a chance now to dig into our creative um bags and find something new to dig into the the communication and relationship bag and find something new and reconnect to all of it i think um because yeah. that's the thing i'm really enjoying reconnecting with people creating finding new things to learn learning about how to set it, this up my on my own yeah you know the only reason i can say well i'll do the adr from home now because it's because i learned how to do it because i had to do adr from home yeah for something else and i was like well i can do that myself i'll just get the kit it's a small kit and I can set it up and we're good to go. So yeah, there's, there's ways we can all find a way to keep alive and creative yeah. whilst we're doing this. Yeah. Yeah. I really, I, I really hear that. I hear it, especially just, we are learning what's important. We are learning who's important. We're, our value yeah. systems are suddenly very clear in a crisis yeah. like this. Um, and you mentioned this idea of listening to your body. Cause I wanted to ask about that too. I mean, also, everything you're saying about the crazy Oscar season amid the filming, amid the premiere thing is yeah. reminiscent of when you ran a half marathon on a two-show day during yeah. the color purple. Yeah. <laughs> and you're saying that yeah. l- like taking a break and taking a day off is like, that's a skill that you're still still learning? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I like it was, it's only now I think that I'm able to be like, I need a day off. Yeah. I don't want anything booked on these days. Like, because there's like a level, I guess there's like a level of guilt. You know, I realize how privileged I am to be in the position that I'm in. Mm-hmm. I realize how privileged I am to be working the way I am and doing the things I, I'm doing. And so I, I guess when, I guess I, I don't like to complain, you know, I don't like to sure. complain about what I have because there are people who don't have it. And so it takes me a while to, to ask for, time off to ask for a second to not do something. Um, and so I'm trying to learn to make sure that when I ask for it, it's not when I'm at my wits end. Yeah. That it's like at the very last minute I'm asking. Right. Yeah. 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 It is. Yeah. Totally. And is your physical health, I know, I know that you are someone who's, I would love to hear about how your, how your relationship with your body and your physical health is related to your maybe creative process or your, yeah. I mean, I assume that being a run, being able to run a half marathon or being, you know, working out as much as you do, especially when you're doing an eight show uh, musical, Me. are those yeah. two things linked? 
Yes, they, they were for me, they were. Yeah. I really needed it. I really, really needed it. Mm. Um, because it was somewhere for me to go mentally that didn't include the show. It was like my space. It was like this oh. this time, this hour that I use to work out, to run, to do whatever that doesn't include the show mm. um, gives me a space that's all mine because no one would talk to me about the show whilst I was working out because I couldn't really give you any answers. I was in it, it moving around, totally. couldn't really, I was trying to concentrate on breathing. So I get to have the room to do myself, to mm. do me. And, and, and it also was like, when I started running, it really was like a source of meditation for me because it was able, it was the time where I was able to like, and I say this a lot just because it really rang truth for me and it really was what was happening. I would run and I would, I would run without music because I could sort of hear my brain, like Mm -hmm. reorganize what I needed to reorganize in my brain. New things were happening all the time. I, I would joke with friends that I'm like in a state of newness probably every day, something new happens every day for me. And so, and still, even still something new happens every day and something comes up and it's like, Oh, this, I didn't know this was going to happen. And I, I guess I was using my running to really like figure that all out, you know, put them in the boxes that they needed to go Mm. process things, organize things, put things in in an order that so I could work through them in the right way. And when you're on a run, you sort of like lose yourself. You're in your own sort of, you find your rhythm, you find your breathing. And so you can really, you really actually can think. Yeah. Um, and it's, which is tough to do when, when you're on stage and there are people asking you for things and there, there are people watching and you, you're trying to give as much energy to everybody else as you possibly can. Mm. Running gave me a space to give myself the energy, mm-hmm. I guess. I guess people like because I I I did I did um, an extrovert introvert test oh. and uh, I've only just learned that I'm an introvert, which means not that I like to shy away from people, but that after a day of performing or from in front of a lot of people, I give lots of energy, hmm. and so by the end of it, I'm really tired, hmm. and the only way I can recharge is if I take time away yeah. and end up being on my own for a second and take a minute to like breathe and think for myself. And so I don't know that I had the language whilst I was doing the show. I don't know that I realized that that was what I was because I think I thought I was an extrovert because I was on stage because I'm, uh, you're presenting. Totally. But actually it's not necessarily what you're doing that tells you what you are. It's how you recharge. Yeah. And because I recharge by being on my own, that makes me an introvert. And I only just learned that now, but now knowing that mm. I can, I can, I have the language to, to know when, oh, I'm feeling drained. I should take a moment for myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I think that I was doing that with my running. I think I was doing that with my working out. And it is yeah. really, it really sounds like it was meditation and, and still is. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Has this transferred over into, cause you've largely made a jump from that stage acting section of the career to film acting is the yeah. running or the physical exercise. Is that a, a through line? Yeah, I think the physical, the, it, it's still, it's still with me right now. Um, I kind of just paused a lot of it and I'm trying to find out because I'm here and I'm, I'm able to like repair and I think I've become really good at listening to what my body needs. And Amazing. now my body is telling me, oh, it's time we can move now. We can really like get into it. We can get back to our physical state. We can get to our focus running. We can go to run. We can get, get on a jump rope. We can get on a bike and I'm looking forward to it. But for a while, it's like, oh, stop. Mm. There's no time yeah. to do that. You need to keep some of the energy that you're expending. Yeah. Right. It's all, it really is about listening to your body. And that takes practice, I guess. Yes. yes. It, what else? Talk to me more about the, I mean, the jump, I guess, from from stage to screen. Yeah. I, and I don't know that I really, I don't know that I expected it to happen as quickly as it did. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> it was so unexpected. I knew I wanted to do screen work. I just didn't know that it would happen in such a big way. Um, right. My first film was, was Widows with Steve McQueen. And I was just like, oh, this is this a is huge a career. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Huge. And I, yeah. And, and so now to be embarking on a film career like this yeah. is really awesome. It's really awesome. And to sort of learn about what this world looks like, um, 
is eye opening and interesting. And I, and I, I think I feared that when we, when I started this, I wouldn't have, I guess, the creative freedom that I, that I think you can get from being in theatre. I see. Yeah. And I'm learning that that's not necessarily the case. I think it really is to do with like the choices you make and what you want to do. And also about saying no to certain things. If you know that they don't uh, enrich you the way you want Mm. it to. Um, And I've been really lucky in that I find I've been finding really wonderful characters to play and I've been trusted with making decisions about who they are and how they are and what they look like. Holly, for instance, uh, uh, from the outside, she had a conversation with Jason Bateman about her before I was cast. Hmm. And, and afterward, and in the, in the script, there isn't really a description of her. It, it just talks about sort of how, how different she is. Mm-hmm. There's no description about what she looked like at all. So it really was. And then when we came to it, he let me sort of decide what that uniform would look like, mm-hmm. what she would look like. So I worked with my hairstylist and my, my makeup artist to be like, I want her, I want when you look at her to be like, oh, this is. She's interesting. Who's this? Yeah. Yeah. So the box braids that are like that weird sort of copper color. Mm. So it's close to the skin and, you know, just that kind of like simple, simple makeup. It's mm-hmm. not it's overly uh, expressive about it, mm. except because it's so simple, you get to see her face so much more. She's like everything in it you read. Um, the button up, I worked with the costume designer, all the button ups and the chinos and the boots. That was her sort of running uniform, whether it be short sleeve or not, it would always be, always be a button up mm. until she was in her house where she felt safe. Mm. Yeah. And I thought it was just like a uniform. I wanted to create something that told you when you looked at her, this is how she likes to present to the world. Mm. This is how she feels safe when she's out in the world. Um, and this is, uh, there is a uniformity in the way she um, appears to everyone else mm. that I think she believes keeps her safe. And that's what I wanted to do with her. So cool. But I was able to sort of like find it myself. Yeah. Um, and, and it's the same with when it comes to the direction, nobody was like, speak in this cadence and give me this. It was sort of, I sort of got to discover who she was on my own. And she's almost totally the opposite of me, okay. to be honest. And yes. yeah, totally the opposite. And I really loved finding that because it was just different. Mm-hmm. It was a new experience to be able to invent this woman uh, from scratch. Yeah. yeah. So this character building process, it's certainly not a one size fits all. Any character you get gets the same process. It depends. Yeah. Very much but it's so. so cool that one of the one of the ways to do that is that is it called an outside in approach of like this is her look and that that yeah. then kind of dictates who she is on the inside. Yeah, I, I I for me I found that that was what was happening with Holly. I sort yep. of when I got to look at who she was when the first time we put the wig on and the, the button up, I was like, oh, that's who she yeah. is. And so it was oh, we're gonna if she she wears that one ring, nothing else. She wears every single like for me I have my piercings and they let me keep my piercings because I was like I don't know in my head I was like this woman Mm. she's sort of out of the ordinary so there are things that you think oh she wouldn't do that but then she does Mm. and so for her it was in my head it was like there was a compulsion to to go and have a piercing so like all of the piercings were the the exact same earring except for like the little hoops that I wore at the bottom everything was like the small Mm. gold a stud cool. every single one of them and we just kept it that way um the i the nails were the same every time it was one color mm. no no anything it was like same length every so that there was this sort of uniformity that i could add to who she was which sort of like i guess helped to find her rhythm mm. and, and you know you read the i read the words and there was for me there was like a heartbeat in the way she spoke cool. it was cool. like and it would speed up occasionally when she was panicked. It would speed up when she was mm. put upon and then it would slow right down and it, her, the gaps that she would take the breath in certain placements that aren't necessarily the norm, but that's just how she thinks. Mm. You know, there's a moment where she turns up at someone's house and it's like, I'm sorry, my brain, sometimes my brain thinks faster than my, my actions. I, I think faster than I speak. And you're sort of like, that's the rhythm. It's like everything comes before she's able to um, process. Mm. Right. So she's, these the odd way in which she phrases things is not because 
she can't phrase it in a normal way. It's just that things are coming to her faster than she can say mm. almost. Very cool. So she's figuring out how to, to communicate it. That's I just cool. learned, I had so much fun working on her and discovering her and creating her. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I mean, I can't not thank Richard who, who wrote it and Jason for even thinking of me in the first place. Cause it meant that I got to have this new adventure, hmm. um, with this woman who I'd never met before, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you as an actor, I did want to ask specifically about Holly, like a line, like, um, the line about your thoughts arrive at a certain pace. That's like yeah. a clue for you in the yeah. character building process. <laughs> I didn't get to that until like the first episode when I first read it. And when I read it, I was like, oh, oh but there's, yeah. there is, but th- there's a wonderful clue to who she is um, in this. She has a uh, one, this is one of my favorite speeches to, and it was so much fun learning it because it was a, it was about pace and mm-hmm. um, I, I don't know. There's just something in it um, and where she speaks about who she is and why she's the way she is and what she can do. And what she likes and what she doesn't like. She's, you know, she talks about the fact that she can tell you this, the height of a, a building faster than most people. She can tell you what date it is mm. in 20 years from now on the same day. She can tell you, uh, you know, where everything, where all the music, rock and roll songs were charted before they fell off. But then she says, but I, I can't fly because I hate heights and it makes me throw up. I, I don't like, I don't listen to music because I don't like it. Mm. Uh, and I couldn't tell you if I, if you asked me what day it is, what date it is today, I'd have to look at a calendar. Mm. You know, the, the outsideness of her mm. is sort of like in that entire speech. And cool. to be able to like say that, those speeches, I just was like, I had a, a ball learning that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the other thing about Holly is that she exists in the Stephen King universe. Like she is not, created from scratch as opposed to like for example your characters in widows and el royale are totally fictional yeah harriet tubman is a real person but of course that's a script so are each of those kind of different categories of like not to mention seely who's been played by other people (laughs) and it's stage so do you think of it that way too of like especially for holly i guess did you do all of the reading of all of the books that holly's in honestly i try to approach each person as though they were totally new okay um, so for Holly, I did, I didn't read the book. I didn't ask any questions. I, I knew, I think there was an, another, uh, there may have been a series or something where, where it was, I think maybe played by another woman. Yeah. I hadn't seen that just because I feel like in order to give myself and the character a chance to sort of really live again, mm-hmm. I owe it to myself to discover it. Mm. Um, so if I like, obviously with, with an Aretha, you do the research because you want to find out who she is because she exists right. with Harriet. You do as much research as you possibly can if it exists so that you have clues as to who they are because they do exist. But with a Seeley, mm. she is a fictional character. Yes. Played by other people, but mine is not to imitate those other people. Yeah. Mine is to give you a rendition of Seeley that I believe should exist in the world. Mm not to say that others shouldn't exist, but so now you have a choice of which Sealy you are drawn to. Mm-hmm. And if, if you're more drawn to Whoopi, go and see Whoopi. And I love, I've watched that film a million times. Yes, me too. It's beautiful. Yeah. And I, when I, when Fantasia was on, I, I listened to her sing because I think there's no one that sings like her. I think oh, there is yeah. a coolness in her voice that no one else has. But I also have a duty to give you my my CD, yeah. who I see as, who I've, when I read her on a page, I don't necessarily read her the way Fantasia does or the way Whoopi does because I have different eyes and different ears and I hear and imagine things differently yeah. because we're all human beings and we all have our own individual thoughts and feelings. And so when you when you come across a character that's been played before or exists on paper, I think the the best thing to do is really to figure out who you see them as Mm -hmm. who how would you say these lines how what rhythm do you think they have in your body because if i try and assume someone else's rhythm that already exists it it won't feel genuine it won't feel grounded and the one thing i want is for my characters to feel real and grounded yes it goes back to the listening to your body because how are those lines going to live in your body in your rhythms Exactly. How much of that process is that thing you mentioned earlier of this character is 
nothing like me is a little bit like me? Like, are there degrees to which you, you share similarities? Yeah, I think, I guess I, sometimes it does help to find the similarities in, in these characters and because it helps to like connect you to them. I think there are times when a character needs to be connected to a person and, and the best way to do that is to find what, what is the same in you and that character Mm -hmm. that sometimes opens up a door for you in and an insight into who they might be if it's like an obvious connection but for but for some characters because there is no connection it it sort of also acts as a way to free everything up I don't know this person they don't know me and it really is a thing of like who is this person and I have to get to know them um you so that you kind of can find an intersection where you can both meet because you don't know each other. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and for, for Holly, I sort of, be, so strange because she, she, I guess my, my hairstylist would joke that when I was on set and I was in hair and makeup and even then sometimes afterwards, I didn't exist. Cynthia did not <sighs> exist. Holly was there. Whoa. Like even the way I would speak to someone or like the, the rhythm in which I would say it. And he would be like, She's not his <laughs> That's Holly. That's crazy. And I watched, I watched a, he, they, he sent me a video of me walking across the, um, the, the set when I was on the way to the stage um, hmm. in the Holly costume, but not, I, I wasn't in a scene. Mm-hmm. I was just going to set. And I watched it and was like, that's not how I walk. Wow. So, so something had changed in which, like, I'm, I'm watching me dressed as Holly, but not playing Holly. I'm, I'm still Cynthia at that point. But that, I was like, that's not, that's not how I walk. That's so wild. And, and speak too. I wanted to ask about your accent work. Yes. <laughs> you know, like, are you on set as Holly still with that, that very clipped? We talked about like the rhythm of the way she yeah. talks. Are you as Cynthia yeah. in between takes talking like that with that American accent? No, no. Oh. I sometimes, I, I, most of the time I'm switching back, but there are times when I just sort of can't help it. Yeah. So that you end up just being her. And if the, if the, the takes in between, if the space in between the takes are so small, you sort of, mm. there's no reason to come out of them. Right. You sort of still, on, I, I sit sometimes on set and just wait for the scene to start again cool. because, because there isn't really a space to come out of the, that person. She's in a different kind of entity. And I'm, I really enjoyed her, but she was so different. Mm-hmm. I don't think I realized how much change I had to make to become her right. until I watched it back myself. Mm. Yeah, I'm so fascinated by this idea of when a character is nothing like you, nothing, yeah. that you have to determine what you kind of agree on. That's It's, it's yeah. almost sort of beautiful. Like you have to not erase yourself because as you're saying, it lives yeah. in your body. It comes, it's still going to come from you, but Holly's going to take over a little. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Harriet too. I mean, I assume Harriet is, is it safe to say Harriet's another example of someone who's distant from you? Yes and no, because Harriet, I think the special thing about Harriet is that we were so um, physically matched that uh-huh. I sort of knew I could do the job in my physical body mm-hmm. she she was five foot nothing almost mm-hmm. uh she uh sang she was really strong uh, running she ran like all like all of the physical capabilities that she had they i had mm. um and so i guess we were sort of aligned in that and so i, I guess the agreement there is that i give you my physical body to do with as you please so we can tell the Oof. story you know what i mean yes because i know that my physical body is close to the physical body you had um and it is capable of doing the things you were you were able to do to some degree so there's that that agreement that you make to be like okay so you you take it and, mm. and let it go. Because honestly, there was, I, I would make the agreement genuinely. I would, you know, I would pray every morning and they would ask for spe- specifically to make the space safe mm. for her to come in, mm. for her to be there. Uh, and I guess the space wasn't just the space around me, but also of me and in me. So like make it safe for her to be present so that we can tell the story as mm. well as we can. And when you ask that of, I believe you ask that of a of a person who existed, yes. you are asking them uh, 
and you are telling them that they they have the permission to be in the space. And, and that's what I, that's what I did with Harriet. Mm. I didn't need to do that for Holly because Holly, I guess uh, my own decide like decision to make the space for her. Right. She appeared in my body. She appeared as me because of the work that I was mm. doing in finding out who she was. Yeah. Um, and it's the same for Aretha, I guess for Aretha, I, I asked to make sure that she has the capability to be a part of me, that my voice is uh, clear enough to make the sound she makes. And I, I've been listening to some of the recordings that we did because I'm singing live on set. Mm that's not a vo- the sound I make as Cynthia. No. no. You're sort of, I've listened so much to her that when you are singing back, you're singing something that already exists and you're trying your very best to be as close as you are, uh, close as she is uh, to her own voice. Yeah. And really I'm just sort of like trying to give myself the chance to make the sound that she makes. Yeah. And so listening back, you're like, that's, that doesn't sound like me, Amazing. but it's really cool to hear it. Yes. <laughs> Well, yeah, that actually, I was going to ask about singing too, and this idea of kind of almost getting lost or almost channeling something. Yeah. Maybe that's true, especially for Aretha Franklin, whose voice is, we've all heard so much. Like, do you yeah. find that singing, specifically singing, is yeah. a little bit of a, you are a vessel and you are letting something else come through? Yeah. And I think that all the time, even when I'm right. singing as me, I think that, I think that in, if the song has, a story that is a truth, you kind of just let, have to let that ride. You need to let that be the thing that takes everything forward. And I, I truly believe that singing isn't necessarily just making sound and making things sound pretty. Right. I honestly think it's about uh, telling your story, telling a story, If even if you haven't written it. Um, a song I love to sing is Why by um, Annie Lennox. Hmm. Um, just because it really is like, a story of these two people who just can't make it work Mm. and they're trying desperately to do so. And the best way to sing that song is just to, to listen to the lyrics as you sing it, to sing the meaning of the song as opposed to just the words. Mm. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, There's what's the lyric? Um, I tell myself too many times, why don't you ever learn to keep your big mouth shut? And, and sometimes it hurts so bad to hear the words that keep on falling from your mouth, falling from your mouth, falling from your mouth. Tell me why. Like when you're speaking to someone and you're asking why, it's that it's yeah. that sort of like because it is. It's like it has to feel like a question, and the reason why the chorus is literally the word "tell me why." Mm. That's it. That's yeah. the chorus. Tell me why that that's like a that's like a, a plea. It's a plea right. to be to be told something. And if you put anything other than that on it, then like, you're not right. communicating. It's lyrics and melody. Yeah, what a perfect yeah. example. I was yeah. really just trying to trick you into singing, basically, on this. Point. <laughs> <laughs> this episode is brought to you by UCLA's professional programs at the School of Theater, Film, and Television. Think you can write two feature screenplays or a TV spec and two original TV pilots in less than nine months? If you are accepted into the UCLA professional program in screenwriting or writing for television, you will. Both programs begin this fall. Learn from renowned UCLA instructors and you will receive a world-class education in less than a year, an intimate environment with a maximum of 10 students per instructor, guidance from writing your script through navigating the industry, and a certificate of completion from the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television. Just Google UCLA Professional Programs and you'll find them. Cynthia, this is so amazing. Um, Just big picture overall, because, you know, we mentioned like your life just accelerated when you made this transfer to Broadway and then made this transfer to Hollywood and everything. And you've spoken about this before, but how has the dream changed? What was the dream at first? And like, where do you go now? And how do you envision these things, you know? <laughs> I think the dream the dream started as wanting to be a performer in the professional space, like to really want to be able to sing and act and tell stories mm. and do that well. And then I guess the dream 
accelerated for me because my I started following my my gut and my heart. Mm. So when I knew that the color purple was coming, because this is in London, when I knew the color purple was coming to London as a small play, I knew that I needed to do that show. Like mm. I knew, I knew like I know my name. Cool. That that was the show I was supposed to be doing. I can't describe to you the feeling I had when I knew it was coming. Mm. I can't describe that because it was so um vivid to me that I was so sure that this is the thing I needed to be doing. Wow. And I fought tooth and nail to do it and ended up doing it. And then it changed my entire life. Mm -hmm. I honestly do not believe I would be here talking to you about a film career if the color purple didn't happen. No. Right. And if, if it, if it wasn't, if I am, if I did get here, it would be in a very different way. Um, I honestly believe that doing the color purple was part of, um, a little script that was written for myself at the beginning of time. I, like I don't, cause I don't know why I was so laser focused on doing that particular right. show. I've never been like that about a show before. Like I've been interested and been like excited about something, but I like, I knew outright that that show was the thing I needed mm. to be doing. And so when that happened and the dream was like, well, if it goes well and we end up doing something like Broadway, I was like, that's a, it's like a, one in a million chance, who knows, wow. that would be lovely. And then Broadway happened. Mm. And so I guess I realized that when I spoke things into existence, I, I, I do believe that speak words have power. Mm. And when you speak something on your life, you're allowing the universe and God and whoever you might believe in mm. to, um, and I say this all the time, to know that you are ready for whatever else is to come. Mm. So I feel like, when I got to Broadway, I was like, you know, what? I would really love this career to expand and be bold and different. And I want to do film. I want to do TV. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to be, I want to be able to create. I want to be there at the beginning of things when things get made so that I can have an input and I can create space for other people. And so that dream started happening. Mm -hmm. It happened almost immediately after the color purple and so I'm like in the middle of the dream right now. Like I'm in the middle of this dream that I was asking for and sort of navigating that and figuring out like then for me, the next thing is really to be able to be a person that, that creates material, not just for myself, but for other people yeah. to, to be in. Uh, I want to create platforms for people to, to showcase them. I want to be able to make space for other women of color. I want to for me, and this dream is real. I really want to create a school. I want to create a performance art school. Oh, wow. For, because the thing I didn't realize when I, I went to school pretty late, I went to RADA when I was 20 years old, mm -hmm. um, simply because I didn't know. I didn't know that you could do that. I did the normal school system, went to primary school, went to, to secondary school, which is high school, went to college. Mm -hmm. Um, and started going to university and thought this doesn't feel right. It doesn't, right. I'm not filled. I'm barely turning up to these. Um, I was turning, uh, I wasn't going to the lectures because I was writing the papers without needing to be there. And I'm passing, passing, not challenging. getting, like, not, it, I wasn't challenged at all. Mm -hmm. And I knew that it wasn't right for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I took myself to this young actors company, um, auditioned. It was like a, a youth company where they would sort of give you some drama training hmm. um, at a theater and they would do a showcase at the end of it. And I was just like, I'm just going to go and do this because it feels like it was right. Hmm. Turns out I ended up bumping into a woman called Ray McKen who um, told me that I, <laughs> she told me I couldn't come to this young assist com company unless I uh, signed up to audition for a drama school. Okay. I was, I had to, go up to her office, fill in an application form. And she was adamant that it had to be RADA. Oh. And I was like, I'm not going to get in. I don't know why you're pushing it. I'm not going to get in. Stop doing that. Uh -huh. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. She was like, if you don't apply for this, you're not coming to this class. Okay. She wanted you to really take it seriously. And yeah. Yeah. So I applied to the school with her. I remember I sat in her office. I sat with her, applied for this drama wow. school before I started this young actors company and the rest is sort of like history. And mm. the thing is, had it not been for her, I wouldn't have known to do it in the first place. Right. I wouldn't have known. And so I, I guess I want to create a place for people who would not ordinarily know. Okay. So that they know that they can come to this school and learn. That's beautiful. Yeah. 
and, and that's what I want. And that, you know, the biggest dream I have with, is to be, is to be a studio, to, to be able to yeah. create things on my own, to, to join with different companies and different production companies, startups, new writers, new directors, um, to create gorgeous things. Mm. Really. That's, that's what I want to do. That's so, that's so wonderful. And it's so cool to hear like how you manifest, how you manifested yeah. this, these leaps. I mean, your yeah. career is a, is a career of leaps and bounds and I guess whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> and I think you're you're so right. There's a thing that you have to sort of like. I think I'm unafraid of of big things. I'm unafraid yeah. of the things that might be sweeping, um, but I'm still learning how to manage them. You mm-hmm. know, and I think that that is a really for me in my life. That's a, a wonderful thing to be able to um, experience. The fact that I'm always having to learn. I'm always having to yeah. recenter. Because if I, if I was always, if it was always like I'm, I'm walking on a wonderful, even floor, I wouldn't learn anything. If it feels like I'm slightly mm. walking on the tightrope rope every time, sort of like having to like rebalance myself. Cool. Then that's where the learning comes, yeah, you know? Totally. When the enjoyment of, of the life I'm in mm-hmm. comes, I have to like learn something new and refocus. And it, because it means that like every day something is new and every day my, yes. the capital the things that I know gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That newness yeah. that you were talking about. Yeah. And it sounds too like you're ready. You as an actor, but you as a, just as a person navigating a career, if and when an opportunity yeah. comes knocking, it's you are ready. You you are prepared. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Brilliant. I think that that's, I think that is where the preparedness comes from. The idea that mm. I guess it's like not knowing what it is that's coming and understanding that the thing that you don't know that's coming might come. Yes. That newness, to know that that, that newness is around the corner, that newness can, can, can come to you at any time, that makes you prepared. Just knowing that it might happen. But, in, but like embracing the uncertainty of what that might yes. be. Ugh. Yeah. Yes. And that's... You have no idea. Like I had no, no exactly. idea. If you had told me, if you had told me when I was 15... 20 even mm-hmm. i'm 33 now if you'd have told me that this is what would have been happening this is where i'm going to be i would have ha- i would have been like okay hilarious thank you <laughs> right. thanks for thinking of that for me and i really like i accept what you're saying and we'll see what happens because you just don't know no. but i think because i've i've been thrown into a situation which, where i'm like oh this is new this is new again yeah just sort of like, well, I'll just, I'm just going to keep going with it. It's people might think, oh, of course, pull on that. But it's the truth. I think people don't necessarily understand what it is when, so like Oprah always says mm-hmm. to surrender. Mm-hmm. And in, in the surrender, you sort of find like an ease in mm-hmm. it. And, yes. and that is not necessarily just to, that's not, that doesn't mean to give up. That means to just well, let it be, mm. let it happen. That's what's going to happen. surrender to what might come to you, the good things that might come and they will come. Mm-hmm. As opposed to like fighting against it and trying to find different ways to make it happen. It will happen if you allow it to, you know, and I've sort of like gotten to the point where I'm just going to surrender. New things are going to happen every time. Totally. Yeah. And I'm just going to be there to witness them and enjoy them. And enjoy and them. Go with Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like staying, staying in a place of newness, that that should be contradictory and that shouldn't make sense, but that's, that's what you've been doing for the last, certainly for the last five years. Pretty much. (laughs) (laughs) And like anything, it's a skill to practice, I guess. Yeah. 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 It is because, because being okay with being in a place of newness, um, can be scary. Yeah. Cause we all like to be comfortable. We all like comfort. Yes. We all like the familiar. We all like that. Totally. Um, Certainty. Exactly. Yeah. But we don't learn anything new when we're in the same place the entire time. And that can't, that goes with everything. We don't learn anything new in a relationship if it's the same from day one mm-hmm. to the last day. That's not how it works. We don't learn anything new if the work is always the same. If you play the same character every time, you're not learning anything new. The fact I I purposely choose each role to be different than the last mm-hmm. because if it's the same, I'm not learning anything new. It doesn't it doesn't earn me anything. I don't mm-hmm. I don't gain anything from that. Holly and Celie 
are two different people. Totally. Holly and Harriet, different people. Aretha and Celie, different people. Mm -hmm. Like Darlene and who, they're just different people. Yeah. I learn every time, it means every time I play a new character, I'm learning new skills as an actor. Mm. You're on that uneven ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I haven't had to do this kind of speech before. I haven't had to say this kind of how, what, this rhythm is different and I can't really yeah. use the thing I used the last time. So I'm going to have to find something new. Right. And now I've got something new for the rest of my life. Totally. Totally. And you take something from every role. You take multiple yeah. things from multiple lessons. Yeah. From, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're only going to do that if it's challenging. Exactly. Yeah. And different. Exactly. Yeah. That's pure gold advice. Thank you, <laughs> Cynthia. You're amazing. Um, can Thank I ask you. you some not quite rapid fire, but very backstagey Go on. Backstage questions. Do you remember, so how did you get your, let's say SAG card? How do you get your SAG card? I think I got my SAG card from Widows. Oh! Widows was my first, it was my first screen job. Okay, well that's, well, that's first film. Yeah. And did that's you get your film. equity card from The Color Purple on Broadway? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cynthia, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, those are the two like biggest answers to that question I've ever, <laughs> I've ever gotten. <laughs> um, okay, what about this? This is hard, but what is one performance that every actor should see and why? Stage, screen, anything. Oh, oh, that's that's tough. Yeah. And it does not have to be a performance. It could be. We just had somebody answer a, do a documentary uh, performance. You know what? I saw I. Okay, so I'm going to give two. I'm going to give mm -hmm. you two. I saw, I was actually, I watched Six by Sondheim. There's a, a documentary called Six by Sondheim. Yes. I can't remember the actor's name, but he plays Tony mm. in West Side Story. And he does a perform. It's just a singular performance of Who Knows. Mm -hmm. And it's just so detailed. Mm. Like, I, it's it's still in black and white. Like that's how long ago it was. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's one of the original, I think it's like the original Broadway performance of, of okay. West Side Story. And it's just a performance of who knows, you know, who knows. Da, da, da. Oh, so, I think it's, is it Something's Coming? Something's Coming, I think is the, right. his first song. Yeah. 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 It's, Tony that's is what it an is. underrated that, role. Yeah. It's beautiful. Totally. That, that song is Something's Coming. Yeah. And he stood in one spot. Mm. It's, I love it. It is cool. one of the most mind blowing performances I have ever seen of a song. And my, like my, the hairs on my, like my arms stood up cool. and I was like, because it was so, so understated. Hmm. I was like, Oh, this is nuts. This is nuts. It is nuts. Amazing. I was like, this is, this is one of the, that's one of the performances I think okay. everyone should be. Okay. I'm cheating now. I'm cheating. Okay. Please. So everybody should, Viola Davis in Fences. Yes. Brilliant. Yes. Brilliant. Gut wrenching. And then on the flip side, everyone should see um, Meryl Streep in Devil Wears Prada. The speech that she makes about ah. cerulean. Uh huh. Yes. She talks about cerulean blue. It's about the sweater that Andy comes in wearing, and it's like, and she sort of just dress. It's a dress down. Yes. That's what she does. Yeah. But it is. It's how to deliver a monologue 101. How to deliver a monologue, like the movement in it when she's, she puts the belt on, she asks, at, whilst doing three different things. Yeah. She's, she's not talking to her. She's now organizing an entire, whilst talking to her about this kind of outfit, talking to her, dressing her down, getting an outfit ready at the same time, moving her across the room like she's water, grabs a belt, put the hat on. No, I don't think that works. Take that off. Then and has a con another conversation at the same time with, uh, yeah. with, with Stanley Tucci, with Stanley Tucci have, having the same, <laughs> and he's like unaware of the dress down that's happening because he's only paying attention to her. Yes. It is one of the most amazing things I have ever seen. <laughs> and, and, and it's why it's why Devil Wears Prada is one of my favorite films yes. because that moment alone is brilliant. Yes. Because there's like, it's like everything and nothing all at the same time. But just in general, her performance in that movie mm -hmm. is one of my favorite, one of my absolute favorites because she just, 
it's the switch she manages to make from from human and mm. hurt and pain to the the, uh, the uh, total opposite cold <laughs> and nothing bothers her and she's in yes. control of everything yes and it's like even the, the way she moves like the way she moves yes. like there's god literally nothing stops her like her stride if yeah. you watch the way she moves through it it's it's amazing and like I, I guess I love that because w- one of my favorite films after of hers is Julie. I think it's called Julie and Julia. Yes. One of my favorite she, Meryl Streep. Yeah. It be, it's beautiful. Yes. Because now she's like buoyant. Yes. And silly. Yeah. And silly and yeah. fun and yes. giggly and sweet. And like, it's just, a, it's the opposite. Like they're two different people. It's so opposite. It's not even yes, funny. I know. I, love watching them i like watching them one after the other because i'm like yes. it just to com- like to compute how she moves like water in this one and mm. she's like a balloon in the other Ooh, yeah and talk about an outside right. in approach too those are both such good examples of like the hair and makeup must have very much informed yeah yes very much so. yeah with this because like in this in uh, devil wears part of head that like even that sweep the swoop of the hair oh my god in the hair it's like <sighs> And it moves the same way. Whereas hers in, in Julie, it's like this curly, yeah. frizzy, mess of like fun brown hair. It's totally. just like. And she's playing a real person. Yeah, they're very yeah. different. Yeah. Yeah. You just named three of my, I mean, Viola in anything, but F- Fences is probably her best. And those oh. two Meryl Streep. I mean, oh my gosh. They're, I, because they're masterclass. Yes. It's like a yes. masterclass in, in, in I don't know how to give a monologue. You watch first Viola Davis do that last speech in Fences, and then you watch the sermon. Oh, my monologue. God. <laughs> <laughs> I watched it in the theater. I was like, what on earth? I can't take this. Oh, my goodness. You have excellent taste in movies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, my God. I have to let you go. But, okay, so, but one last question. So, obviously, we've spoken about your younger self, I loved hearing about the very beginning of your career and like the yeah. butterfly effect of you never knew what, what tiny little things at, the, at that point branched into yeah. all of this. What advice would you give your younger self? If you could go back in time, is there anything that you wish you'd known? You know, I, I think I probably would have answered this question differently hmm. maybe five, six years ago, seven years ago. I don't know. But now I don't think I would tell her anything. I okay. think I would just have to keep going. You know, because I think the the path, I don't know that h- how I am now and what I do now would be the same if I, if she knew something sure. different, Sure. you know, and I think that her learning things and discovering things the way she did uh, has led to where I am right now and led to the way I, I think and feel and the way I get to speak mm-hmm. about things because she had to learn the way she did, you know, for me, I think the only thing I would tell her is just to keep going. You'll get that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great advice for our listeners too. I mean, Cynthia, this has been back to front, brilliant wisdom. Thank you. And inspiration. And, and I'm honored and I wish we could have done this in person, but it was honestly pretty fun to do it over video. So that I got to like, see you and have yeah. a conversation. Yeah. It's not real yeah. eye contact, but you know, yeah, it's good to connect. You are lovely. You are, th- you are actually, this is great. Thank this you. is one of them. Thank you. One of my yeah, conversations. You are the you are the greatest. And I'm sure I'll talk to you again in another five years when you have another Emmy and another Tony and another everything. Let's do that. Let's keep like having conversation. Yeah. <laughs> also, there is talk of a Devil Wears Prada like Broadway musical. Yeah. So like maybe you should play Miranda in the Broadway musical. <laughs> I mean, that would be kind of cool. I would love to, but I think I think they may have someone doing that already. And I don't know. She's I, I like, I hope they don't neglect the detail that was put in it. Mm. There's such detail in that movie. Totally. There's such detail in that performance and yes. the, just the words, the way that it's put together, there's such detail. In it. And, you know, I think most people would sort of like disregard it as a fun movie. That's really, really cool about that. It's a rom-com or it's silly. Yeah. But actually, if you really pay attention, there are some really beautiful, beautiful moments and real humanity and real discovery of, um, the way in which women can be treated in that industry. Totally. Uh, well, I'm going to go watch Devil Wears Prada now. So I think I might do the same today, to be honest. <laughs> I, just, I think we should do that, both of us, yeah. Totally. <laughs> uh, this is so lovely. Um, I'm so looking forward to everything, yeah, everything to come, including Aretha. 
when it arrives. Yeah when it arrives and it will yeah. uh, because we're working on it still and, and I know that they're excited to, to share it so yeah well thank you for all your words today Cynthia thank you so much have a good one bye In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.